I'd never gotten one of those paper slips before. The ones that called you down to the office. Every day, as the dean's assistant walked into my class and handed my teacher a stack of slips, I'd watch wistfully, hoping that one would come to me and add some excitement to an average day of class. <laughs> then one day, I not only got a slip, I was called down to the office and sent home immediately. There was no excitement. There was only fear. I had no reason to feel this way, no information. But the minute I heard the panic, on my mom's voice on the phone, I knew that something had happened to my grandfather. My grandfather had heart disease for 20 years, but I had no idea because I grew up watching him move about constantly. No matter how often we asked him to take a seat, he refused. He was always in charge. He was so strong mentally that it fooled us into believing he was strong physically too. And while he had his fair share of two day stays in the hospital, a cardiac arrest was something I should have seen coming, but didn't. Now, he's lying on a hospital and barely breathing, and I'm walking through life on my tiptoes, unsure of what my next step will be. Every morning I wake up, and I don't know whether I'll drive my car to school or rush to the hospital to wait endlessly for news. I don't even know what I'll wake up to anymore. A good morning or a goodbye. I feel the tension. I feel it pull the strings of my everyday existence, knowing at any minute that the puppeteer God could wreak havoc in my life, could yank me out of place and throw me into an alternate play of nurses, hospitals, and vent ventilators. Here I am, trapped in a room with 30 other people and the remnants of last night's Chinese takeout. Here we've been waiting and sleeping and eating the past three days. Then out of nowhere, sirens start to shriek, code blue, code blue. And as they call it our room number, room 527, desperation settles in. And I'm rushing and panicking. I don't know whether to pray, pray or cry or scream. My nod is the one having his third cardiac arrest, but it feels like my heart's frozen. As I watch through the glass, doctors and nurses rushing in, calling out words and phrases I don't understand. 20 minutes. For 20 minutes we stand watching our father, uncle, grandfather, not knowing if he's alive in that weak and tired body. Not knowing if he has any breaths left to give. I feel tears slide down my cheek, but I can't feel the sadness that comes with it. I try to evoke it in myself, try to remind myself this could be the last time you will ever see him. But what comes next is in sorrow. It's guilt. Guilt that I didn't go visit him last night. Guilt that I could have lost the chance to say goodbye. Guilt that as the years went by, I made time for school and friends and homework, but I couldn't give him a few more minutes of my life. And now, I'm begging for a few more minutes of his. My mother is huddled in the corner. Her body shaking as she tries to compose herself so that she can take care of the rest of us. It's different for her. She understands the words, she understands the odds. While the rest of us have nothing to do but pray and hope and wish, she has to accept the reality of medicine, the consequences of being a doctor. But I don't understand, and I feel alone and empty and lost. 20 minutes, for 20 minutes, I hear nothing, I feel nothing like a statue, I am cold and mute. And then, as the doctor walks in and tells he's alive, just barely, it's like color comes flooding back into the screen of my life. And I feel everything I couldn't in the last 20 minutes in a matter of seconds. But most of all, I feel relieved, relieved and grateful that God gave him one more chance. If late at night, but we're all here crowded in this hospital room, because we need to hear the sound of the ventilator breathing for my Nana, we need to watch his chest move up and down with each breath. And then the doctor walks in 
And we raise ourselves in the anticipation of more good news. A little light comes back into our dark and tired eyes. But what comes next pushes us to the floor. His kidneys fail. He needs dialysis. There's a good chance he won't live through this. To walk out of a room, leaving someone you love to die, feels brutal, heartless. His battle for life became our fight. His every progress and failure became ours. And this, the ultimate failure we've been warned is coming. It's one we can't join him in, and so we feel lost and empty. We have no control over his lives or ours. I feel the anger. I feel it rush through my veins. This isn't fair, is isn't right? Failure, then success, and failure again? It feels like we're being played with, and it's a game of deadly consequences. I look up at the sky, and I want to scream, who do you think you are? What did we do wrong? My family doesn't deserve this. <coughs> is there a point to my anger? Is anyone even listening? I've been a devout follower of Islam my entire life, but in five minutes, I'm questioning every religious ideal I've ever followed, questioning if God exists, if he cares, if he's listening. And then, as my anger resides, I beg, I bargain, I'll pray every day, I won't swear anymore, I'll study harder. Some of my promises don't even make sense. Others, are impossible, but I'll do anything to keep my Nana in that moment. And I understand then that I have to believe in God, because if I don't, I'll lose all hope. Because it's comforting to know that some force has the power over my Nana's life that we don't. Sunlight streams through the blinds of the hospital room in which I somehow fell asleep last night. It's sunny and nice, but I wish it was stormy and bitter outside because sunlight makes people happy and that's not how I want to feel right now. I'm not sure I'm ready to open my eyes to create reality knowing that someone I love so much might not exist anymore. I open my eyes and land them desperately on the face of the first person I see, and I'm in shock to see the curve of a smile and my aunt slips. I race down the hospital, slam open the door, and almost crash into the doctor telling my mom that he made it. He made it through the night, that it would be a long recovery, but that he was a fighter. That somewhere deep inside his weak and failing heart was a deep and vibrant love of life, a need to survive, and most importantly, a love for his children and grandchildren. He loved us, so he fought. Six months later, I watched this man back in his house taking charge in this very audience. And he is still the strongest man I know because of that love in his heart that overcame body, sickness, flesh. Sometimes I wonder if that love is even stronger than God. If God really did call my Nana up to his gate that night, and if that love stopped him from taking that path up. If God changed the blueprints of my Nana's life because he couldn't bear to tear him apart from the people who loved him so much, the people who loved him. I like to believe this because then, love is a supernatural force. But more than that, it's our salvation. And yes, love is unpredictable and irrational and painful. But when love is strong enough to overcome rationality, predictability, pain, that's when love is at its strongest. That's how it saved my Nana. And I will never question God's existence again because I know that that love is the strongest evidence of God's existence. Because if God didn't care, if he didn't love us, we might never have been given my Nana in the first place. And 
you might never have gotten him back. Six months ago that night, my Nana's heart killed him. But when all else failed, it saved his life. 